Well, Rajesh and Duncan and everyone here, thank you so much for such an honor. I mean, um, for me, just listening to all of that, it's a surprise and an honor. And uh, that has been really much what my life has been about. It's all been a real, quite a big surprise. And um, I was thinking about uh, when we set up Virgin Money nearly 25 years ago, Richard Branson put in two million quid at that particular point. Uh, and it took us about six weeks to set up the business. And uh, it was a complete accident that I was involved with it. And uh, we invited uh, 40 people to join us on uh, temporary contracts to come and see if we could make Virgin work in financial services. And the thing that really astonished me of all of those 40 people 25 years ago was it was really clear that what they really wanted wasn't a job, it wasn't to make money, it wasn't to create profit. It was to come to work and make a difference. Nobody comes to work, do they, to answer the telephone or fill in an application form. But we all want to do something that makes a difference. I remember I worked uh, for a very long time with uh, someone called Dave Dyer, who many of you here in this room will know, uh, who worked with me and lots of guys for many years, uh, lastly as my CFO. And uh, he stuck around for quite a long time, despite all of the ups and downs of uh, entrepreneurial life. And I said to him once, why have you stuck around so long? And he said, because we've got a purpose. I never realized, and Jim used this, used this word, I have never realized before in my business life that purpose was so important. And the purpose that Virgin Money stands for and the purpose that um, drives us all on, I guess, is our corporate ambition, which is to try and make everyone better off. And the thing that's fascinating about having a purpose, is, which is to try and make everyone better off, is it sort of enables everyone that works as part of Virgin Money to make their own decisions because everybody can choose what better off means to them. And it pushes people into the business, it engages people, and actually it pushes people out of the business if that culture doesn't really work. Uh, and it enables us to take some risks with business too. So I thought I'd just give you a couple of examples before I know you all want to go uh, home tonight. But about, um, when would it have been? 2007, you'll all remember that Northern Rock got into trouble. And uh, we were tiny, there were about 300 people in Virgin Money at the time. And uh, we decided somewhat audaciously that we should try and rescue Northern Rock out of the beginnings of the financial crisis. Um, and subsequently, after a lot of hard work, it was nationalized. And we had, uh, as I say, three, 300 people or so that were facing the financial crisis and had nothing to do. And we had to think about how would we save their jobs. And just as that happened, Richard Branson rang me and he said, Janan, the London Marathon have been in touch and they really want us to sponsor the marathon. And I think we can share it. Perhaps you do a quarter and Atlantic will do a quarter and active and media. And it won't cost that much, really. Well, of course, the financial crisis then got a hold. And one by one, all of my friends, and thank you very much because I see Atlantic are in our brochure tonight, so they are still friends, but they all fell away and we found ourselves with the bill for the whole marathon, no bank and no money. Um, and so we had to think, how were we going to cover a three million quid then a year sponsorship, as you'll remember, Paul, Joe, Caroline? Um, and we thought, well, do you know what? Uh, there's a company out there called Just Giving. It creates uh, the ability for people to make donations online. Why don't we copy that? We're a bank. We must be able to do that. We'll do it cheaper. Um, and so we were able, because of Richard Branson's personal support, and that's really important, I think, who are the leaders and supporters of good business, to spend time whilst the financial crisis was aflame, building Virgin Money Giving. The wonderful Jo Barnett, in her sparkly gear tonight, courtesy of her daughter, apparently, um, has run that business for eight years now, Jo, is it? And you should be hugely congratulated. Uh, as a consequence, 650 million pounds has gone to charity. In the end, I will shut up in a minute. In the end, um, we did buy Northern Rock, and um, we went through a, an interesting uh, M&A process, I suppose you'd call it that. And um, there was obviously a, a formal contract to sign, and uh, I was um, quite surprised to find myself signing alongside George Osborne to acquire Northern Rock. But before that contract was signed, I was called into HMT, and it was Mark Hoban at the time who was the city minister. And he sat me down and he said, Jane, and you might be signing a contract, but there are some promises that I want you to make. I don't want you to make people redundant in the Northeast. You shouldn't close branches. We want you to support the foundation, and we want you to pay us back the interest on the loan that they were leaving into the business. 
So I said, yeah, of course, Mark, of course we'll do that. Went back to the board and agreed that's what we should do. And uh, over the subsequent three or four years, we were sort of pleased and surprised that the Treasury involved us as a little bank in all sorts of stuff. Um, and I remember asking one day, uh, why is it that uh, you keep asking us to come back and get involved with stuff? And some of you will know Gwyneth Nurse at the Treasury. And she said, well, Jane, do you remember you made those promises to the minister one day? And I said, yes. And she said, well, you kept them. And I said, is that a surprise? And she said, yeah, nobody keeps a promise to a politician. And um, not long after that, Caroline and I were uh, called into HMT. And uh, I think the city minister at the time, interestingly, was Andrea Ledsom, and we weren't quite sure why we'd been called in. And we went into her uh, oak-panelled room, and Andrea and two of her assistants were there, and there were no papers on the table. And we were both slightly dubious to have been summoned into this uh, great, uh, great room. And Andrea said, I know this is really odd from the Treasury, but we want to give you some money. And I, and I remember us both being rather perturbed. And Andrea said, the only one of your promises that you couldn't keep was to keep the Northern Rock Foundation going because that, I can't remember exactly how much it would cost. It would have cost us 17 million quid a year at a time when we didn't have that amount of money. So she said, we want to help you to keep the promise, so we will give you four million. Am I allowed to say this? Well, probably not. We will give you four million pounds. Can you put in a matching four million pounds and set up the Virgin Money Foundation? We were astonished. We did, had no idea that that was going to come from the government. And the film that you saw um, was created by Nancy Doyle and uh, the brilliant people at the Virgin Money Foundation, actually courtesy of a bit of promise keeping and HMG. Um, and then finally, perhaps, I just wanted to talk a little bit. Rajesh, thank you so much for talking about women in finance and the importance of diversity and equality, which is something I'm passionate about. Um, and it was actually at a dinner, not unlike this, um, back in June 2015 at the Mansion House dinner, um, that all of that started for me. And um, so I don't know whether any of you will recognize this particular experience, but there are people in my life, I found, I, you know, who certainly, I don't know why, but maybe because I'm a woman, perhaps not, who knows, do talk down to me. And Goldman's would never do that because they're here now and our friends. But there is one particular investment banker who I've always felt has probably got it in for me. And uh, I went along to the Mansion House dinner this June 2015, and I walked in, and as many of you who will have been there know, it's quite intimidating because you go into this big hall, and almost everybody there is a man. Almost everybody there is a white man, and everybody, you all look gorgeous gentlemen, but everybody's in your type DJs, right? So it can be quite intimidating when you're on your own as a woman, and I was looking around to try and find someone that I knew, and I could see Antonio Hortorosario in a corner. I went over to talk to him. And uh, as I was talking to Antonio, this investment banker who always looked down on me, I thought, came over probably to talk to Antonio. Um, but Antonio turned away at that point, and so this guy was left talking to me. For those of you that have been, you'll know that at this dinner, they have this really complicated seating plan. And uh, you know how it is. You sort of the, you, you unfold it to work out where you're sat. And my eyesight, I don't know about anybody else that's my sort of age, my eyesight was perfect until about a couple of years ago, and now it's completely imperfect. And it had just gone imperfect then, and I'd forgotten, and so I didn't have my glasses, right? So this guy said to me, and, and of course the problem with these dinners is that you start off, uh, you sort of know your place because you start off in the bottom left hand of the, corn, of the seating plan. You sort of work your way up or down or around to the middle. And uh, as um, uh, I was talking to this guy, he said to me, so, Joan Ann, where are you seated tonight? And I said, I don't know, can't see, the writing's too small, and I haven't got my glasses. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, let me have a look. So with a flourish, he unveiled this seating plan. And I know I'm not allowed to use bad language tonight, Duncan, so I won't. And he went, gosh. You're sat next to the Chancellor. And I have to tell that story every time I can, because I love it every time I tell it. And um, I sat next to George Osborne that night, and it, it was quite funny because um, uh, we, it was interestingly, given that, the, that it's this week, he was talking about RBS and his speech. And uh, as his speech, as he stood up to make his speech, he said to me, um, you do realize that the cameras will be on you as well as me, so could you try and look interested? 
And um, unfortunately, as a consequence of trying too hard, there's now this picture that my friends laugh at me looking adoringly at George Osborne. <laughs> Uh, which is what, not what I'd intended at all. Um, but anyway, the next day, his office got in touch and said, um, actually, the Chancellor's asked if you would lead this work uh, around women in finance because it's part of the productivity plan. We really believe that this isn't just about doing the right thing for women. This is about doing the right thing for society and the right thing for our economy. And so I got involved in looking at why women do not uh, progress in financial services in the way in which they do in other businesses. Only 14% of senior managers in financial services are women, and that's just not good enough. So we have put together with the Women in Finance Charter. We're delighted that so many people have signed that charter. Um, and so many people in that, this room actually have signed that charter. And uh, I was thinking about it and, uh, a couple of nights ago. As I saw, I don't know if many of you saw the program about the suffragettes. And if you haven't seen it, it was on BBC One a couple of nights ago, an hour and a half of what the suffragettes went through to get the vote. And I'm afraid to say I didn't know just how bad it was. Imprisoned, force-fed, tortured. And 100 years on, we're still here talking about needing to fight for women's equality. And if we don't do it, then who will do it? because it is so important in this world, which in my view is needing social purpose, diversity, equality, and the power of people to really understand that we are the people in these rooms in London that can really make a difference to the world, to our children, and to our future. And for me, that's the power of business. We're not here just to make a profit, or if we are, frankly, we should be ashamed of ourselves. We're given positions of privilege to change the world and to make a difference. I um, was fortunate enough to have a note from the Archbishop of Canterbury recently, and he said to me in that note, Jane Ann, some people think that the business of business is business. But surely the business of business is human flourishing. We need to make a difference. And I continue to read on. This wasn't from Justin Welby. But I did read somebody somewhere say, it's really important to realize that in business, you have to do what's legal. But just because things are legal doesn't mean to say they're right. And so for me, it's such an honor to accept on behalf of Virgin Money and the city and business everywhere this award because I know that everyone here, everyone in the future, and everyone that can really make a difference will want to do things right. Thank you very much.